All right, we're live. We're live. Hi, my name is Jamie Speckert, head of school for Think Global School. And I'm Mike Harheim, uh, head of technology and strategic outreach. Yeah, so today's session is uh, lessons learned from a traveling high school. And Mike and I will be uh, kind of answering your questions and highlighting some of the great things that we do at Think Global School. A little background behind myself is I'm a um, former educator from the state of Minnesota, ran a couple schools there, and then I moved out to the Middle East and ran a boys boarding school before taking my current post at uh, Think Global School. And uh, I started from the technology side of things. I started as a consultant for IBM and uh, became IT director at a private school um, here in Ontario, Canada. And then, uh, you know, about eight years after that, I uh, was invited to join the founding team of TGS. So we started in um, 2009 in the planning stages, and uh, I guess the rest is history. We'll touch a little bit on how things went, I guess, in the last five, six years. Um, just a couple logistics things. So uh, this lovely conference is sponsored by these kind folks. So we'll give a shout out to them. And then we have a few participants. If you would like, uh, you can drop your pointer on the location you're coming from. Uh, so if you click the little star, I'm going to put, I'm actually in Toronto right now, so I'm going to drop my star right there. And maybe join And I'm actually in Florence. Like yep, and I'm actually in Florence, Italy right now. With the, with the students and staff. <laughs> Jamie <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> definitely do that. <laughs> Jamie drew the, drew the short straw because he's up at uh, 11 o'clock at night. I get, I get a nice cushy 5 p.m. Yeah. time slot. So, so uh, thanks for joining us. And Joy from Miami. Uh, so our, our presentation is on lessons learned from a traveling high school. And uh, if you just joined us, my name is Jamie Speckert, head of school. And with me is Mike Orhane, uh, head of technology and strategic outreach for the school. You want to go to the next one, Mike? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, let's dive in. So we wanted to give start with a bit of an overview of what our school is all about. Um, essentially, we are a uh, international boarding school that travels. So our, our school is fairly self-contained. We have our own students and our own staff, our own curriculum. Uh, but we travel to three international locations uh, each year. And uh, in the, each of those locations, we work with the host country community to provide students with learning facilities, accommodations, local experiences, service learning, and, and other authentic learning experiences. So we're not a single semester travel program or an exchange program. We run as a fully accredited high school, um, but we have no building. We use technology for our brick and mortar, and we, we move around the world, and we um, so our students produce work and we talk about our experiences. So just to give you some quick facts to kind of help form the picture, we started in 2010. Um, so we've been, we're on our uh, third graduating year now. We've had two sets of graduating years to go, uh, go past. Uh, we run from grade 10 to grade 12. Um, we did start with a grade 10, a grade 9 class as well. Um, but for lots of different reasons, we decided to focus on the older ages, so we, we focused on 10 to 12. Uh, right now we run with 43 students, and we have 16 on-site staff, and then we have other supporting staff that, uh, uh, that work remotely uh, from different international locations. Uh, we do um, have a kind of high technology environment. Uh, like I said, you know, that takes the place of our brick and mortar, so we have uh, se uh, several online platforms. Each student has an iPhone, an iPad, and a MacBook. And media production is kind of a regular expectation uh, within their work. Uh, this year we became an Apple Distinguished School, uh, so for the 2015 to 2017 cohort. And uh, we are accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges. And we are authorized to run the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. So our mission, uh, this is our second version of our mission. Initially, when we started off, we had a slightly different mission. And as uh, the school grew, uh, the people um, who were involved decided to 
work on the mission. And so our current mission is that Think Global School challenges learners through firsthand experience of, of global travel to become compassionate individuals who are curious and knowledgeable about the world and motivated to affect meaningful change. Um, recently, I, I was reading an article uh, about college admissions of tier one schools, and one of 80, 83% of the schools surveyed in tier one schools were really interested in our students having uh, global competence or cultural competence when they come to our school. And so one of the things that we capitalize on is because um, our school uh, travels the world with a diverse group of students and a diverse group of staff, is that we really feel like we excel um, in that global mindset uh, um, through discussions and experiences with kids. And so um, we're really working hard to get our kids to be curious about the world and really think about what their role in creating a socially just world um, when they leave TGS and while they're at it. Oops. Oops, oh, sorry. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, so we also want to talk about, so we're a very mission-driven and core value-driven school. Um, these actually aren't just uh, lip service. Um, you know, we, we, we work these into every aspect of how we assess students and, and how we make decisions from a leadership perspective. So we really do um, use these as to help guide uh, how we do things. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out about our core values is that the, these were student, uh, students were involved in the creation of them. So uh, a number of years ago, we had a, a strategic planning session that involved everyone from board to teachers to uh, to students um, and even a, a few parents and outside people. And so one of the things that came out of that uh, when we were trying to decide what our core values were was this idea of borrowing uh, core, borrowing concepts from other languages and incorporating them into our core values. So a word like Kaizen has, is a single word, but it has a, a lot of meaning behind it, maybe more than trying to explain the same thing in English. So. Um, so yeah, these, these play in, into a lot of uh, what we do. and. Um, are a good source of inspiration, I guess, for a program. Uh, the student body themselves, just to give you a picture of that side of things, so like I said before, 43 students at the moment. Uh, they, they currently come from 23 countries. Uh, so the biggest group is uh, U.S. students, but they're, they account for about 10 of the 43, and the rest come from where you see the stars there. So we've, we've always... Um, wanted a diverse school. Uh, we've tried to compose the student body to be diverse by design. Um, the other uh, part of the picture, I guess, is the we're lucky enough to have a fairly large endowment uh, in, a, in a healthy scholarship program. And so we have a listed tuition on our, on our website, but um, we, we have all ranges of uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. So everything from full scholarships to full pay and, and everything else in between. And that directive actually came right from the founder who wanted to have uh, those who were wealthy, uh, you know, learn beside those who uh, were not, and, and, you know, to make sure that students can learn from each other. Uh, but different ways of living and different cultures and everything else, they can learn just as much from each other as they do from traveling around the world. Yeah, so... Everybody, this is one of the kind of the key questions that everybody asks us, like, well, how do you pick uh, the locations that you want to go to in any given year? Um, and, you know, I kind of joke every once in a while, we put up a big map and we throw darts at it and wherever it lands is where we go. But actually, it's, it's quite a complex um, process. Uh, uh, we, we, what's interesting is that uh, so many times, uh, bureaucratic regulations and visas dictate a lot of what we do because when you try to run a school with 23 different nationalities and at the student level and about 16 nationalities at the staff level, not every citizen of the world can get into every country or it becomes challenging for some citizens of the world to get into other parts of the country. So the first thing we kind of look at is, okay, what countries can we get into? We kind of look at um, what countries provide an amazing learning opportunity. And we, we talk about that a lot in the sense that we believe that travel is one of the best mediums for creating disequilibrium from the perceptions 
of what students believe the world is like and the reality when they hit the ground of what it's like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. And so we, we come up with a list and our founder, Joanne McPike, really is instrumental in, 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 in making sure that we're picking not only not the most comfortable places that are in the world, but places that are going to push us um, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually in, in a direction that is different from where we came in. And so that becomes a really kind of a, a balancing act between what we're allowed to do and what we want to do. Um, and that changes. So like in one year, a country may be easy for us to get in, but they may have had an event or the government change. And that following year, um, that country may be more difficult. That happened actually with us this year. Um, we were going to spend our first term in the UK, and the UK made it uh, challenging for 18-year-old, our 18-year-old students to get a long-term visa. And so we had to modify our plans. And so you become very agile and adept um, when trying to run a school that um, has to go through all these different governmental agencies. So one of the great things I think that we that we excel at and, and the lessons that we've learned here at, at Think Global School is that we have really, um, we have kind of two components. Uh, we, we, we definitely host up and post up into a, a country. So for example, last year we, last year at this time we were actually in Greece for about 90 days. Um, and Athens was our host city. And, and um, the American School of Athens, Community School of Athens, was our partner school that we partnered with. Um, but within that learning environment of, of, of making friends and building relationships with ACS, we also have another component of the school called our We Explorers. And these are our intense field study um, times um, outside of the classroom. And some of you may be familiar with the IB's Week Without Walls, but TGS uh, is often more outside the walls than in the walls. Um, and so one of my teachers came up to me and said, hey, we'd really like to teach the, the Odyssey. And I was like, oh, that, that, sounds, that sounds fun. Um, what, what do you guys want to do for that? And he's like, well, we'd really like to recreate the journey. And I was like, you know, most teachers are thinking about a metaphorical journey of Odysseus. Um, but my teachers actually said, would it be possible for us to um, get a boat and actually recreate the journey uh, to Ithaca? And most heads of schools in most places would probably say no to that. Um, our operative word typically here at TGS is, is why not, as opposed to why. Um, so they did. They got to recreate this, um, this mythical journey of Odysseus. And uh, uh, there's links at the bottom of the page of some iBooks that students created uh, along this journey and the, the work that was created. And so the Odyssey, um, which can be, I mean, I've read that in high school, some of you probably read that in high school, can be kind of dry at times, um, actually um, burst out of the pages uh, for our students as they went to the cave with them and they talked about Odysseus' struggles and they recreated um, metaphorical plays on board and all these things have been captured on our web page of the learning that happened um, when students are outside of the classrooms um, bringing some of these great works to life. And so that's we're starting on, we're, the lessons we've learned is that the more kinds of experience where you can actually connect those things like of the classroom to the outside world, the more deeper learning um, uh, students actually um, feel. I think it's important that, to note too the, the, it's how it's connected. So, so they, they, they'll do a bunch of work ahead of time in preparation for these things and then they have the experiences all kinds of uh, learning activities that go on during the experience and then afterwards there's sort of the reflection production piece uh, and that that we found is a kind of really nice flow for uh, for these trips and connecting the trip back into what's going on uh, in the classroom experience. So when we talk about this experience because I talked about this experience actually with the American Community School in Athens, uh, the parent-teacher organization and they're like well that's that's an amazing experience. We we don't necessarily know if, if we can you know afford that or we can't do that. And when I tried to explain to um, the parents of the PTO, is like, okay, it doesn't have to be that level. 
um, it could be a different level. And so the next experience that we, we jumped in, and this is actually was the term that just ended prior to us coming to Italy, was, was we went to Bosnia. And I think what was really important about Bosnia is we picked Bosnia. And I got to be honest with you, a lot of people raised their eyebrows. They said, why are you going to Bosnia? There's, you know, there's, there's no Eiffel Tower. There's no great museums there. Why, why would you go to Bosnia? And I said, look, I think, I think Bosnia, I, I, I kind of put it all on the line. And I said, I think Bosnia really could be an amazing learning experience for students. I think as we have some really good contacts there, I think we could do some amazing, amazing things with, with the community. Um, it's not a, it's not a location that has a lot of things to see, but it has a lot of people to, um, to be part of our, to be part of our community. And so, we went to Bosnia and everybody had these preconceived notions. This is when I talk about this equilibrium before. Everybody has this, this, uh, this idea of what going to Bosnia means. Now, if you were born before, you know, the 84 Olympics, you, you know, you could, you remember Sarajevo and the Winter Olympics. And then during the 90s, you obviously you remember the war and the tragedy that happened in, in the Balkans at that time as the uh, uh, Yugoslavia broke apart. So we go into Bosnia and people, you know, parents are questioning whether it was safe, whether it was a good idea. And, you know, we had a lot of talk in the community like this is, this is really a good option for us. And then we, and then we popped into Bosnia. And the, the projects that our students did were um, so amazingly connected to the community. Um, we had a, our group of students, uh, 10 of our students worked with 10 Bosnian kids and they reproduced um, Bosnia's English, trans, English uh, tourism video um, in collaboration with each other. Uh, we had groups of students work with um, uh, artists and um, theater groups in Mostar uh, with Bosnian kids in, in that part of the world. We had a group of students work together um, trekking through the Bosnian mountains as they learned in collaboration uh, advanced first aid skills together. Okay, so all these different projects were happening um, in collaboration with the students. And so the projects ended, they, our students presented all these amazing pieces and um, we sat down with students and we're like, you know, you say, okay, this term you've been to Stockholm, last year you were in Greece and you were in Costa Rica and you were, um, in New Zealand, what was your favorite term? By far, the students were saying Bosnia was our favorite term. And it's because they said, I had these notions of what the world was like when I came into the country, and I left with a completely indifferent kind of view of what Bosnia and Sarajevo uh, was. And, you know, I was like, Part of me was like really happy because it was exactly the kind of learning experience that um, kids are capable of, of participating in when the disequilibrium is different from what they perceive and what it is. And so if the experience is so much like um, your own home country, then it's a little bit more of a stretch sometimes to figure out the learning opportunities that happen or how you change as a person. Bosnia was so outside the zone of what students expected when they landed, that the learning was really deep and rich. And, and you know, this kind of experience in Bosnia is not something that cost us a lot of money. It was actually really inexpensive project-based learning. And any, any school community could, um, could do this, uh, do this kind of piece with local communities or um, a community down the road and those kinds of things. And so, I think TGS is really good at um, doing some things that are really outside the box, but doing things that also are replicable uh, with other communities. Mike, you got anything you want to add? Uh, no, I just would echo that. Just the out of all the locations we've had, I think that was the, definitely the biggest change in in minds and mindsets, and I think that's what we've been trying to to go for all along, and I don't think that would have happened uh, without a focus on connections with people. Um, and so, yeah, there's we we took some some serious lessons from our time there. It also extended to parents. Um, you know, the 
parents had equally narrow views of Bosnia as uh, I decided myself uh, going into the country. Um, and so parents were able to kind of uh, learn a bit more about the, about the country through their own kids as they came home and told their stories. So um, it doesn't just necessarily stop at the, at the students when we're talking about a global perspective. So do you want to jump into some of these lessons, Jamie? Oh, we might have lost. Can you, uh, whoever's listening, can you just pop in the chat just to make sure you can hear me? Okay, great. I think Amy just dropped it. So, I mean, there, I'll uh, I'll talk talk a little bit about some of this. So, b basically, we wanted to kind of pick on a, a few different things of some some kind of lessons we've learned, and a lot of our lessons have come out of uh, I'll be perfectly honest out of failures. So, we've been we've tried lots of things. Um, we've had successes at some things. We've had uh, you know plenty of failures as well, and so trying to kind of um, Boil it down. We, we we wanted to come up with some you know, some definitely ones that are affecting the way we're thinking about the program now and and how we want to move forward. We have enough enough years uh, behind us now that we can uh, we can really reflect um, with a lot of evidence, uh, and that's really helping to guide uh, how we going for how we move forward. I'm back. Actually, jumped off. So this is the first one, Jamie. You're back. It's funny. It was like the internet in Bosnia was amazing. The internet in Italy. It is not so great at times. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting, the preconceived notion from the time that the internet's going to be bad, but it's not. It was actually amazing. Uh, so our lesson learned, uh, you know, and this kind of goes back to the Bosnia lesson, really, really drove home the lesson. We I had another experience, I uh, still had another experience in Bhutan, when they went to Bhutan and had some really deep community connections. But there's a tendency, there's a, there's a possibility when you travel, um, to uh, be encased in your own bubble, that you, you don't go out and about, um, that a traveling school or an international school is really confined to its own campus or its own mindset. You know, um, I, I've worked in international schools for a little bit now, and, and I do see that bubble even, you know, in international schools that I have fixed locations, they, that the expat community or the community that they work in is really kind of um, insulated against the, the you know, the, the, the local community. So, for example, is how do you avoid the bubble? How do you avoid, you know, because, it you know, it takes a little bit of courage and it takes a little bit of, you know, outward projection to not just, like, retreat into the safe confines of your small community. And so, we really felt like the biggest lesson that we learned, the one the we explorers that did really well over the past six years, and the we explorers were like, eh, they're okay, but you know, da 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 da. And it all boils down to the connection to, to the local community. With, without those connections, we're just kind of tourists. So, for example, I just got back from a, a small we explorer with students. We we rode the train into. Uh, Rome, and we stayed in Rome for four days this this term, um, just recently. I just got back from that. And one of the projects that we that we worked on is like we we went to see the Colosseum, and we went to see those you know works of art that you know everybody knows Rome for. But one of the things that we did that was really quite quite good, and I think actually if you ask the students, and I, and I need to do that uh, um, in a more regular way, but um, if you ask them what was the best part of the, the Rome experience, they would probably say that the day we spent with Project Rome. And so Project Rome is, a, and you can find them on, on Facebook, but Project Rome is the mind creation, or the creation of, of, uh, of a homeless uh, support network by these two amazing people who just said, you know what, homeless people in Rome are not, are being left behind. We want to figure out a way to 
change the conversation with homeless people in Rome. And there's quite a few homeless people in Rome, even despite despite that the that the churches in Rome um, supply a lot of uh, of of services. So so we spent the we spent the day with these these two amazing people, and uh, our students um, basically sorted and customized clothing packages for uh, homeless men, and we created and, and, and put together a huge uh, um, meal to be served uh, later that night. Um, unlike most of the meals in Rome, where it's basically everybody gets pasta, that's what you would assume you get, um, the meals that this chef and this, and this um, Steve and Mary would create um, were more um, more healthy for the students, more healthy for the homeless people. So um, our students got to participate with them, and they made connections with these two amazing people who are definitely change makers in, in their community, and they're making change on a local level and doing some amazing work. And so you're always looking for these opportunities for us to be um, involved with local communities kind of wherever we go. And so we take a day off. And we and we and, and in Roman we did that with Project Rome. Now it's not a huge project, but it was. I, w I would say if you ask the students uh, what they enjoyed most about Rome, um, they would they would say that we that project was Project Rome, and that helps us get outside of that. Oh, we're going to the Colosseum, or we're going to go to the Forum. Um, interesting enough, when we were going to the Forum, uh, we got outside of our bubble a little bit because we got involved in a. Uh, a protest, not that we were protesting, but there's a protest that all of a sudden occurred and we were like swept up in the crowd in the middle of the forum, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And so they got to see housing issues come to life. Um, and it was scary and it was, but it was safe, but, you know, but it was interesting that those are the kinds of things that our students will probably remember more, those two things, than um, visiting the Coliseum. I got to be honest with you. It's those kinds of um, experiences that really are, build those lifelong memories and actually change people's uh, dispositions. Mike. There you go. Yep. Okay. So, um, thanks, Lucy, for your uh, for your comments. Appreciate it. Um, so this, the second one um, is, is this is uh, definitely one for leaders. Us, you know, those building schools are trying to make uh, changes in general, and this is what we found again through successes and definitely through failures over the years, is that culture and mindset really trump curriculum. So you can focus um, if you focus by focusing your attention and efforts on building the right culture and the right mindset in in teachers and in students. Um, will gain more, will, will result in a lot more gains than focusing on clever curriculum or clever processes or something like that. Um, you can have the best curriculum we found. We, we can have really good curriculum and provide amazing learning environments and really good professional development even, but if you don't have the right people and the right culture to support those people, change and innovation uh, won't happen. Um, on the flip side, if all you have is is uh, great people and supportive culture and little else, uh, do, good things do happen. Um, we are we're running out of time, so I won't go into to, to detailed examples. But the one one I wanted to point out was the difference between our grade ten curriculum, which our teachers have a lot more freedom, and in the uh, uh, eleven and twelve, which we was a little bit more prescriptive. We we run the IB and um, you know have a little more external constraints, but. Uh, we've told our teachers basically, um, you know, they have to prepare students for success in the IB, but other than that, we really want them to use the location, and that's that's the direction that they get. And and the majority of our Hallmark projects, the stuff that we just talked about, uh, Jamie just talked about, a lot of the things we use as our examples and, and where we want to head is all out of the this, um, opportunities that came from just having the right teacher and the right freedom. Um, on the flip side, we've had the wrong teachers early on, and even with that freedom and environment, they've still done very traditional things, and it's been a hard push to get them to think outside of the box. And even to uh, students, to a certain extent, can be surprisingly resistant to change um, unless they have the right culture to kind of support 
um, not being scared of failure and, and trying new things and, uh, and making sure that um, they have the freedom to kind of think and grow and, and, and move. So our last lesson um, kind of really is driven home a lot is that when you're in a traveling boarding school and you're going all, through all these different places, the, the last thing you want students to be overly focused on, not that they shouldn't focus on it at all, is, is, is a high state test. And so we, we, we've seen over the years that, our, that the high state tests that they take and teach into the test all but eradicate some of the wonder and curiosity that this amazing experience gives us. And so we really, in, in, the, in the quest for accountability, I think, and, and I think what has happened is we have lost that really serious wonder to take advantage of situations that happen. And so um, that, that has, I think that's become a tragedy. And, and we have seen that happen a little bit at, at TGS is that, I'll give you the examples just recently, um, on Wednesday, students get to go out and about in Florence and experience all that you know Florence has, and they put together uh, three or four options to explore the environment. And one day, I I, I asked what students were going to do, and and instead of going out and about in Florence, they actually some students were like a, a number of eleventh graders said we're going to stay home and and study for the SAT exam. And I was like, wow, that that as you know as the head of school here is just like. You know, I understand you have this pressure to perform, but I really think you're missing out on some of these amazing opportunities. And so this this becomes especially um, poignant with our 12th graders, who basically by December are studying so hard and focus so much on their end of year exams for the IB that they miss out on basically two whole countries. They don't get to explore it to the depth um, that our other grades do, and so um, that 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 has become an issue for us um, when, when we look at that. And we really see that transition over time from grade ten to where they're just they want to do things for the sake of learning, and they want to experience things, and they don't ever ask, "Is this on the test, or how much is this worth, or is this going to be graded?" And, and slowly those questions start to come back in as it, as it gets uh, closer and closer to when they have to write um, these high stakes exams and, uh, and where tests become more important than anything, right? So um, that's the worst question for us is, <laughs> will this be on the exam? Like, and, and that includes, for us, I know that annoys teachers everywhere, but um, that includes like, do we have to go on that trip because uh, you know it, it's not an exam? I don't want to do it. Not that, that really is hard to hear uh, when we're putting these amazing experiences together. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. So, so we had these discussions, and, and it's funny is that we we looked at the mission in in the spring, and we deconstructed it, and we looked at okay, like are we actually doing things? According to the mission, I don't think many schools actually actually do that. They don't actually look at their mission and say, "Okay, where are we doing this this point?" And so, you know, as we started doing this and as we started constructing professional development to move us more towards our mission, we we had a number of kind of assumptions that we we, we believed that kind of moved us in a lot of ways. And, and, you know, the first one that we believe is that students should have more autonomy and choice in the learning. And, and this is a combination of a long time of thought processes of looking at healthy adolescent development, what a healthy adolescents need, and also looking at theories of motivation and combining those. And we saw a disconnect between what healthy adolescents need and actually motivational theories and what high schools were providing. And so we, we believe that more autonomy and choice is needed in, in, in adolescent learning. We believe that students should really be more vocal and have more voice and choice in the designers of their own curriculum and experiences. That we got to use technology ubiquitously in the, in the classroom and, and make sure it's real and rigorous. And that learning should not be limited to the classroom and the classroom should not be limited to one teacher and one group of students. And when you, when you have those kinds of statements and when you think about those kinds of things, you come to a certain conclusion, conclusion that your program, while great right now, could be excellent if we made some, some, 
some programmatical shifts. And so this has been a conversation at TGS of the lessons we learned, capitalizing on all those great things that we do do, looking critically at the things that could be better, and then coming up with a new program design that would reinforce those beliefs that the faculty and the stakeholders and the founders and the board really believe that are important for us. So, having done all that, having having had those conversations on so many different levels, you know, the, we, we've kind of come up with the future of Think Global School, and we really feel that our delivery model needs to be more individualized so that students have more choice, that it's more PBL focused based on the countries that we're at and involving community experts in those countries and delivering curriculum in that modality. And it also needs to be um, a, a firm commitment to the ethic of excellence and its mastery base so that assessment becomes authentic and real for students and it's based on the highest quality work, not so much um, what do I need to do to get an A, but more of like, is this your, is this your best work in constant revision, th those kind of concepts. And so having, do, having if, if those are the kind of the two underpinnings of how we want to move, then we need to really kind of look at the countries within our module-based terms and try to craft the themes and curriculum so that they fit those models. Uh, and so we came up with a year-round academic schedule, and we'll actually be committing um, a team of teachers to go into those countries once again and develop um, thematic-based projects with local communities so that when we hit the ground running, we, ha we have a number of those projects uh, already set up and connected to the community and curriculum in a highly authentic and rigorous way. Mike, you want to add anything? No, um, I think you covered it. Uh, Mike, do you want to add anything? I, I think you covered it pretty well. Um, other than to say, I guess, that, uh, you know, all of this is something that we feel like fits well in, in any school. If we were to kind of build our own school that wasn't traveling, um, but becomes even more important what we've seen uh, in trying to really cool. leverage the opportunities that are in front, in front of us. So we, there are a lot of questions we get are around uh, rigor and whether our program is rigorous enough. And, and we, we believe that this, this approach will be, will be just as rigorous, will be just as thorough, will be uh, even more, um, perhaps even more so. Um, but more importantly, will allow us to make use of the, uh, the world around us um, in, a, in a much more rich and authentic way. Are you still there, Danny? Okay, so we'd like, then, we'd like to uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, I know we ran over uh, a little bit. Um, we're going to close. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, no, sorry. Oh, uh, but we created, some, we created yeah. some links uh, for uh, extensions, and if you're curious about. Okay. I cut out. You hear me? Uh, Jamie cut out for. Yeah, just So, just in case for the purpose nope. of the. Sorry, are you there? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can hear you now. So just for the, yep, I can hear. You. Yeah, I'm there now. I'm here now. Hey there. Yeah. Okay. So you just just wrap up, I guess, for the purposes of the recording. Just uh, we missed the yeah. Okay. So, anyways, the um, so uh, we, if you'd like to learn more yeah. or expand your knowledge of what we do and see some of the great work that our students are doing, um, yeah. Yeah. So, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're, we're talking over each other. Um, we just wanted to thank everybody for participating. We know we went uh, over um, 
over time. Hopefully, more people get to enjoy the recording. Um, of course, if you have any questions, um, feel free to um, to contact us on Twitter or through our website. Um, and we these all these slides are available. I'll show the link in a second. Um, but you can take a look at some of the things that we've been talking about. We we do try to share what we do online and, and hope others learn from it. If you want to access these uh, these slides, um, you can get it from the short link, um, and that'll get you to the Google presentation, and you can get access to those other links. So again, thank you very much, um, and we are always open to have other um, have questions from people and uh, and share more about what we do and what we've learned along the way.